A, we are going to delve in to later members of our genus, so later members of genus Homo. So we'll talk about Homo heidelbergensis. We'll talk about the Neanderthals. We'll talk about some of the kind of enigmas or anomalies, Homo naledi and Homo floresiensis. And then if we have time, we may get to Homo sapiens. But if we don't have time, we will get to Homo sapiens next week. All right, so this is part of our genus Homo, later members of genus Homo lecture, which goes along with chapter 11 and chapter chapter 12. It kind of goes into both chapter 11 and chapter 12 in the explorations textbook. All right, so we had finished up on Tuesday. We had just finished up talking about Homo erectus. So the next major species that comes after Homo erectus will be Homo heidelbergensis. And when I say come after, I should clarify that Homo erectus coexisted along heidelbergensis for at least a period of time. Um, we know Homo heidelbergensis likely originated in Africa and then migrated outwards. So Homo heidelbergensis existed in Africa and Europe. We see fossils dating anywhere from about 600,000 to as recently as 130,000 years before present. And then we find fossils in Asia that date anywhere from 200,000 to about 130,000 years before present. And remember, Homo erectus was around from about 1.8 million years ago to as recently as 200,000. So it's very possible that Homo erectus and Heidelbergensis were interacting, um, possibly even interbreeding. We don't know that for sure because we have not been able to extract DNA from fossils this old yet. But some of the common characteristics. So again, you're going to see a mosaic. So that term mosaic is going to keep coming up. So Homo heidelbergensis is a mosaic of Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapien type features. But you are going to see another jump in cranial capacity. So cranial capacity range for heidelbergensis is about 1,200 to 1,300 cc's. So we're really beginning to approach modern day cranial capacity range. But the shape of the crania is quite different than what you would see in Homo sapiens. We do see a slightly higher, more rounded skull than you would see in Homo erectus, for example. But you're seeing still a relatively long, low cranial vault. So that's the forehead region. You're seeing really pronounced double arched brow ridges. So the supraorbital ridge or supraorbital torus is very pronounced and double arched. And we're seeing smaller premolars and molars, which is common with genus Homo, more generalized dentition indicating a more omnivorous generalized diet. All right, so some of the behavioral traits with Homo heidelbergensis. We see that many of these fossil remains have intensive, extensive tooth wear on the anterior dentition, so the incisors and canines. And this indicates that they may have been using their anterior teeth as tools to make clothing. So they may have been holding the leather in their teeth and then, or the animal hide, I should say, the animal hide in their teeth, and then using a tool to scrape it like this. And we see this in Homo heidelbergensis as well as in the Neanderthals. So this has been interpreted as evidence that these species are starting to make clothing. Uh, they have a very diverse diet. They're starting to include meat from large game animals, so becoming much more omnivorous and moving away from that diet that contains just fibrous vegetation or a combination of vegetation, fruit, insects, and tubers. They're still eating all of those things. They're still eating vegetables. They're still eating fruit, vegetation, insects, whenever they can get it, but they're also starting to include meat. So Heidelbergensis likely engaged in cooperative persistence hunting, just like the modern, modern day hunter gatherers that we see today. Um, such as the Bushman that we watched, the Bushman hunt that we watched in our lecture on Tuesday, it has been hypothesized that Heidelbergensis may have hunted just like that. They utilized middle Paleolithic tools that are called Mousterian. So just to think back, Homo habilis used the oldest stone tool technology we call Oldowan. And then by the time we get to Homo erectus, our stone tools are getting slightly more refined and sophisticated. The bifaces or hand axes of Homo erectus are called Acheulean tools. And then we get another level of sophistication once we get to Heidelbergensis, they're using tools that we call Mousterian. And they're also using a technique that we call the Lavoie technique. And, we'll, and the video clips we're gonna watch today is it's going to show you some examples of what this looks like. Uh, but generally, we're seeing, you know, increase in cranial capacity, increase in symbolism, increase in 
um, cooperative hunting techniques, increase in control of fire, migration out of Africa. These are all behavioral traits that we're starting to see. All right, let's talk about the Neanderthals. So first of all, just to clarify, the, the genus and species name is Homo neanderthalensis, but you oftentimes might hear them called the Neanderthals. So the reason it's pronounced Neanderthal is because it's a German word and the TH makes a T, a hard T sound. So that's why they're called Neanderthals, not Neanderthals. Uh, but you may hear it pronounced both ways, but the correct pronunciation is Neanderthal. So we know that Neanderthals existed in Europe, the Middle East, and Western Asia. The, the classic Neanderthals existed between about 130,000 to as recently as 30,000 years before present. So that means that they coexisted with our species, Homo sapiens, for as much as 10,000 years, as long as 10,000 years. Uh, the anatomical characteristics that we're seeing, very large cranial capacity, in fact, larger than ours on average, so cranial capacity range anywhere from about 1,200 to 1,700 cc's, but the average is about 1,500. We see the presence of a new feature called the occipital bun. So remembering back uh, the bones in, the, in, in our crania, the bone in the front is the frontal bone, top sides are the parietals. Then in the very back, we've got the occipital bone, but the occipital bun kind of looks just like a little dinner roll at the bottom of the occipital bone. And it's it's probably difficult to see here in Zoom, but I'll give it a shot. So the occipital bun is this kind of like dinner roll looking feature. And it's the attachment point for the nuchal ligament. So thinking back to the Origin of Us documentary that we watched the bipedalism lecture, you may remember that the nuchal ligament is really vital to keeping the head stable and keep it from pitching back and forth too violently as these hominins are running and you know chasing very dangerous game. So the Neanderthals are extremely robust. Their postcranial anatomy is extremely robust. They would have been you know much much heavier than us, much more much more muscular than us. They engaged in dangerous dangerous hunting techniques. So because they were so robust, that's really been the hypothesis as to why they have this, you know, this occipital bun here in the back where the nuchal ligament attaches. They have other adaptations for the cold. They have a wide nasal aperture. That's the opening where the cartilage in the nose would go. They do not have a chin like we do. When we feel our chin, we have a protruding mandibular symphysis. They have either a vertical or a receding. Like I mentioned, they are very, very robust postcranially. From the neck down, they have very thick bones, very robust bones. They are cold adapted. So overall, their body structure tends to be short, stout, and heavily muscled, which remembering way back to chapter the chapter we did on human adaptation, that may remind you of Allen and Bergman's rule. So Allen and Bergman's rule states that cold adapted mammals will be short and stout and more muscular. Warm adapted mammals tend to be taller, lankier, and leaner. And there's also um, some somewhat recent studies. I mean, I guess it's not super recent now. It's, you know, started back in 2010. Uh, but there are some new studies that have demonstrated that Neanderthals likely interbred with us. So, or we interbred with them, however you want to look about look at it. We interbred with Neanderthals for pr approximately probably 10,000 years because we coexisted with them in Europe, the Middle East, and Western Asia for as long as 10,000 years. And we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. Um, let's watch a little video clip first. So the Neanderthals have a lot, they have a bad rap, essentially. They've got a bad reputation for being dumb or brutish or somehow less intelligent, more violent than Homo sapiens. Um, you know, they may have potentially had to engage in more dangerous hunting techniques, and they may have had to, um, you know, engage in in competition that wasn't present for us simply because they lived in a very harsh environment. So they may have, just for environmental reasons, they may have had to compete with one another more intensely for survival. But there's quite a bit of evidence that Neanderthals weren't by any means any less intelligent than us or capable, any less capable of symbolism, symbolic expression, intentional burial. Uh, there's going to be a lot of examples that I'm going to show you today that Neander Neanderthals were just as capable of symbolic expression, creating jewelry, creating art, engaging in sophisticated tool technologies, etc. All right, so let's watch this little clip here. Okay. Oops, not that. Here. 
check on the second one for you. Let me, let's turn that up a sound. 40,000 years ago. They are the oldest definitively modern humans, Homo sapiens, found anywhere in Europe. But they were not the first humans to call Europe their home. In 1856, an unusual skeleton was discovered in Germany, in the Neander Valley. It became known as a Neanderthal. Stockier than modern humans, with a barrel chest and super strong muscle attachments, Neanderthals have fascinated us ever since. At first, they were dismissed as wild, simple-minded cavemen. But now, we know better. If you look at the Neanderthal skull, you will notice that it's actually rather large. It's a very pronounced brow ridge, doubly arched above the eye sockets. We see a very projecting nose with a very big nasal opening. Not only the face is large, but also the brain case is large. And this is because Neanderthal brains are larger than the average modern human brain. And this is perhaps surprising because Neanderthals have a bad reputation of being perhaps somehow stupid, but this is not true. This doesn't mean that they would have had the exact same cognitive properties as we do, but certainly they were uh, very similar in many respects. In the human family tree, Neanderthals are our closest cousins. Half a million years ago, their ancestors were the same as ours. But they moved out of Africa earlier, into Europe and Central Asia. There, they adapted to a colder climate and evolved into a different species. Not Homo sapiens like us, but Homo neanderthalensis. Neanderthals. They made Ice Age Europe their home, living in small groups, hunting big game. So what happened when modern humans turned up 40,000 years ago? What did we make of the Neanderthals? It's long been thought we were so superior, we simply wiped them out. Is this really true? The remains that Joao Zilao found in Romania tell a different story. They have the features of a modern human. The small vertical face and jutting chin that first appeared in Africa 200,000 years ago. But all is not what it seems. When you look at this skull, it is obviously modern. On the other hand, when you look more closely, some things are not quite right for a modern human. Uh, for instance, the frontal bone slopes backward uh, very markedly. The uh, dentition in particular is very strange. The first molar is smaller than the second, the second is smaller than the third. These are features that you would not expect to find in a, in a modern human. Where you do find such features is among the uh, Neanderthals. Instead of wiping out the Neanderthals, Zalao believes we mated with them. And the two peoples interbred. We call these people Neanderthal and modern human. 
they would not know they were Neanderthal or modern human. We have to think about what is logical in a context like this. People have sex and people breathe. It's just, uh, that's basic human nature. Part modern, part Neanderthal. Until recently, the idea that two distinct human species could interbreed and hybridize was thought to be impossible, a scientific heresy. That's changed, thanks to DNA. The Max Planck Institute is a leader in the study of ancient DNA. In 2010, they were the first people to crack the genetic code of a Neanderthal. The first challenge was to find the right bone, which still contained readable DNA after 38,000 years in a cave. Then they had to sequence the DNA, analyzing every fragment. It was like trying to read a book that's been ripped into millions of pieces. The project was led by Swedish geneticist Svante Pabo. Imagine that what we have in this bag is the DNA we've extracted from a Neanderthal bone. And we illustrated this with an American dictionary that we have shredded. But it's not only this dictionary here, the dictionaries of other languages that illustrate the genomes of bacteria and fungi that have lived in the bone over tens of thousands of years. And our challenge is now to try to find the pieces that come from the Neanderthal genomes among all these millions and millions of other pieces that we're not interested in. What we are faced with is not only that we have a mixture of different genomes here, the pieces are also very small and they get smaller and smaller as time passes. And not only that, they are in addition chemically modified, which we can illustrate with this. Imagine having to decipher millions of fragments that are so degraded they're barely legible. And then using them to reconstruct an entire dictionary. It seems an impossible task, but that's the equivalent of what Pabo and his team had to do with an e. They had one thing going for them. Because Neanderthals are our cousins, their genome was bound to be incredibly similar to ours. Written in more or less the same language. What we do is compare these tiny little DNA fragments from the Neanderthal bone to the genome of present-day humans. And we expect to see just tiny differences because the Neanderthals are, of course, very closely related, after all, to present-day people, at least 10 times as close as a chimpanzee, for example. So in this analogy here, one could see this as a difference between American English and British English, for example, which is very, very similar, but have tiny little differences in how you spell words. It's these subtle discrepancies that embody the genetic difference between Neanderthals and modern humans. It took the sequencing machines two and a half years to sift 
and sort through all the fragments and construct a complete sequence. But when the work was done, they had before them the first genome of an extinct human. One of the first questions we were really interested in was what happened when modern humans came out of Africa and met Neanderthals. Did our ancestors then mix with Neanderthals or not? They compared the Neanderthal genome with that of modern day people from around the world. They discovered a remarkable pattern. In Africa, they found no evidence of interbreeding. But everywhere else in the world, there was a trail of Neanderthal genes. Between one and 3% of our DNA has been inherited from Neanderthals. I was first very skeptical when we started seeing this signal. But the power of genetics is in a way that the data will stare you in the face and force you to rethink your ideas if you're wrong. According to the genetics, interbreeding happened in the Middle East. Around 55,000 years ago, modern humans were expanding north out of Africa. At the same time, the Neanderthals were being pushed south by a cold spell in Europe. The two types of human were destined to meet. And here, they mated and interbred. The genetic evidence undermines the traditional view of Europe's first peoples. If they bred with each other, the two types of human cannot have been so very different. For a century and a half, scientists have been picking over the evidence in Europe, trying to understand why Neanderthals seem so separate from us. They assumed that modern humans are just superior to Neanderthals, and so there'd be no chance of them interacting with each other in any meaningful way. Now genetics is showing us that that's wrong, that these two types of humans interbred with each other. That may change everything. We've got to find a way to fit Neanderthals into this story. They're like cards from a different pack, similar but different. The problem is, if we try to put them in this structure, the whole thing may come tumbling down. To me, as an anthropologist, that's what it feels like at the moment. The old story has collapsed, and we've got to begin to tell a new story about Neanderthals and modern humans, a story about interaction. All right, so compelling stuff there, guys. It's pretty possible, very possible, that if you have European, Middle Eastern, or Western Asian ancestry, that you likely have between three and four percent Neanderthal in your genome. Um, so that was this was a big surprise. This was a big surprise to paleoanthropologists because prior to the studies that were done by Svante Pablo and John Hawks, they really thought that Neanderthals were a completely separate species from Homo sapiens, that there was no chance of interbreeding, that they were basically an offshoot, that they branched off and went off in a completely separate direction. So this was a surprise to the field, to the paleoanthropologists that were studying this time period and studying these species. Uh, but I think it's a very compelling possibility that we interacted with and not only interacted with, but also interbred with the Neanderthals. All right, so behaviorally speaking, wait, any questions before I move on to behavior? We're good, okay. All right, so just like Homo heidelbergensis, they're likely engaging in persistence and endurance hunting. 
But the big difference is they're likely, the Neanderthals are likely hunting slightly larger, more dangerous game, simply because they're living during the last ice age, the last Pleistocene. So they're hunting large, dangerous game, and they're likely utilizing hunting, hunting strategies that require them to be very close to dangerous game. And we know that this is likely a very good possibility because we find a lot of Neanderthal remains with skeletal fractures. Sometimes skeletal fractures that have healed, sometimes ones that haven't. So these Neanderthals, the species was likely sometimes getting severely injured during the hunting process or even injuries that led to death. So that may have been one aspect of their behavior that left them at a slight disadvantage in comparison to Homo sapiens. Neanderthals are using tools that are on the tips of wooden, wooden spears, essentially. So they had to be very close to dangerous game, whereas Homo sapiens were using you know, basic projectile spear points. So they were able to stand farther back and hunt game that was, you know, 20 feet away, for example. So they're hunting the same game, but Homo sapiens may have had a slightly better way of doing it or a less dangerous way, I should say. So there's also some, you know, some myths or rumors that Neanderthals were strictly carnivorous, that they ate predominantly meat. And they likely did eat a lot of meat simply because it was the Ice Age and they had body size. So they... They had to consume a lot of high quality protein in order to support a large brain and a large robust body. But there is quite a bit of evidence that Neanderthals ate a diet that's very similar to ours. They have extracted calculus, so basically tartar from their dentition, and determined that Neanderthals ate a good quantity of plant material as well. So just like every other hominin species, they're omnivorous overall. Uh, but the Neanderthals, of course, may have included a bit more meat in their diet simply because that was what was available. There's not a whole lot of plant or fruit veg fruit material available during an ice age. So they were consuming predominantly meat because of that. So, But overall, they're still considered to be omnivorous. So eating a mixture of plant material, insects, tubers, probably not a whole lot of fruit in their territory and in their time frame. But they were eating a mixture of all types of foods. So there's also quite a bit of evidence that they were not dumb or brutish, that they actually cared for those that were sick and they were compassionate. There's a specimen that I'll show you here in a moment called Shanadar 1. So Shanadar 1, uh, there's evidence that Shanadar 1's lower right arm would have been amputated because we can see healing around where the amputation site would have been. So it's very likely that this individual would have been, you know, very dependent upon his social group for survival. So you know, imagine trying to survive during the Pleistocene with only one arm. So it's very likely that, that individual would not have been able to survive unless his social group had the compassion and the desire to help him survive. And we also know that Neanderthals very likely had at least some capacity for language. Now their language may have not been as sophisticated or as advanced as ours, but you know, we know based upon the structure of the, a bone called the hyoid bone, the hyoid bone is a U-shaped bone that we find in the vocal tract. And we know that the hyoid bone of the Kabara Neanderthal, for example, is almost identical to what you'd see in a modern human. It's slightly more robust, it's thicker because Neanderthals are more robust, but at least the, the structure of the hyoid bone is very similar to what you would expect to find in a modern human. And there's also a gene, when they mapped the Neanderthal genome, they were able to isolate the FOXP2 gene, which has been important in reconstructing their language capacities. We know that modern humans that have mutations or abnormalities in this gene have difficulties producing speech and understanding speech. So it's very likely based upon genetic evidence of the FOXP2 gene and the anatomical evidence of the hyoid bone that Neanderthals had the capacity for some form of language. And um, there's also evidence that Neanderthals were consuming plants for medicinal purposes. There's evidence that Neanderthals were fully capable of symbolism and symbolic expression. I'll show you a video clip here in a moment that will demonstrate this. Uh, but a paleoanthropologist by the name of Zalau um, uncovered some pigmented and perforated shell beads at a site in Iberia that date back about 50,000 years before present. And we know that the Neanderthals were most likely the species producing these artifacts because Homo sapiens were not present in this region until after that time frame. Because sometimes, because there was that, you know, there's that stereotype or misconception that Neanderthals are not capable of symbolism or symbolic thought. You know, some of the 
early paleoanthropologists in the field suggested that maybe Homo sapiens were creating these artifacts and that Neanderthals were mimicking them or just simply found, you know, found them and were using them. But there's quite a bit of evidence now that Neanderthals were fully capable of producing and engaging in symbolism. We also see a lot of evidence for symbolic burial and intentional burial practices among the Neanderthals. We'll come back to the tools here in a second. Let me show you guys. Oh, so this is the Shanadar one specimen here. So this shows you the humerus. The humerus is the bone in the upper arm. So it shows you the left and the right humerus, but you can see the right humerus looks very abnormal. So you can see it's severely atrophied at the proximal end, at the end where it would connect with the bones in the lower arm, the radius and the ulna. It's severely atrophied, indicating that this individual would have had their lower right arm amputated. But you can see because the bone's not sharp, it has soft edges, that this individual survived the amputation. So this is evidence that Shanadar 1 specimen was severely disabled, however, lived for several years after suffering the traumatic injury. And also this indicates and strongly suggests that others in his social group must have helped him heal and survive. It certainly would have been possible for an individual, and Shanadar 1 individual would have been very old for Neanderthal, about 40, 45 years old. So a lot of evidence that his social group helped him survive. So this is oftentimes interpreted as evidence for compassion and the importance of the social group. Um, these are the symbolic burials I was telling you about. So prior to this, the species prior to this, we don't see a whole lot of examples of what we call intentional or symbolic burial. There's possibly an example with Heidelbergensis. We find a mass burial with Heidelbergensis and also a, um, a special tool that was left in this mass burial. But we don't really see ind individualistic and deliberate 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 and ritualistic burial patterns until we get to the Neanderthals. So the Neanderthal burials that we have found in the fossil record show skeletal remains of these burials in the flex position. So basically the knees tucked into the chest. And it's also very possible that these individuals were placed in this position somewhat prior to their death because once rigor mortis sets in, it would be very difficult to manipulate the human body into this position. So it's very possible that this also indicates that once an individual was close to death, that he or she was surrounded by his social group, his or her social group. There was possibly even a belief in the afterlife that maybe being in this body position somehow allowed them to cross over to the afterlife more successfully. And Neanderthal burials are oftentimes found with grave goods as well, such as stone tools and animal bones and even flowers. So there's a lot of evidence that Neanderthals were quite capable of symbolism. So of course that answer that you know poses big questions. Do these ritual burial activities provide evidence for symbolic expression and compassion? Does it provide evidence for a belief in the afterlife even? And of course, these are all just issues that were topics that we can ponder. We don't know for certain that they believed in the afterlife, but we do know that we don't see a whole lot of examples of intentional ritualistic burial prior to this. Neanderthals are kind of the first that we really see this with. All right, so I'm going to show you guys another little clip uh, to show you what I mean about the pigmented and perforated shell beads. So this is the Zalau site in Iberia. Uh, let me pull up the right one here. This one right here. So this one's going to give you some evidence for symbolism and symbolic expression among the Neanderthals. Joao Zalao thinks Neanderthals had talents that went beyond tool making. They also had an aesthetic sense. They were capable of symbolic thought using shells to mix up natural pigments. There are several possibilities to explain this. One is that uh, they painted the shell. They wanted it to be a different color from the original. The other is that they were using the shell as a container for something like body painting or makeup. In societies that lack identity cards or passports, um, body painting and personal ornamentation uh, transmit information about who you are. It's a way of conveying a message 
uh, of, about themselves. Which tribe you belong to, uh, whether you're out to participate in hunting. In a way, you can say that this is modern behavior. And since we have documented it among the Neanderthals, the conclusion is that Neanderthals were more than two. That would be my conclusion. What else were the Neanderthals capable of? Just how similar to us were they? Jean-Jacques Hublin is an expert on a layer of artifacts known as the Chattel Peronian from the early days of contact. This is a tooth of fox that is pierced here. And we imagine very easily how this could be a part of a, a necklace or how it could be fixed on a piece of uh, clothes, for example. And clearly this speaks to us because this is exactly uh, the kind of technique that has been used by recent hunter-gatherers and even today. Archaeologists always thought of jewelry as the work of modern humans. But when they discovered the teeth of the people who made the artifacts, they were Neanderthal. The teeth from the Chateaubriand layers are typical from what we find in Neanderthal uh, dentition everywhere else. You can see here the difference between a Neanderthal upper incisor and a modern human upper incisor. There's a difference in size. There's also a difference in, in shape. In Neanderthals, you have what we call a, a shovel shape of, the, of these tools that you don't have at all in most modern humans. If Neanderthals were making some of the first necklaces in Europe, what does this say about them? and their abilities. For, for decades, science has been asking itself the question of whether Neanderthals could or could not uh, make these kinds of things as a clue to whether their cognition was like our own. It has become clear from the archaeological record that they could do these things. We know they could because they did do these things. It seems Neanderthals were not the dumb brutes of legend. Isolated in Europe for tens of thousands of years, they had developed their own culture, on a par with that of their modern human cousins. But all the while, modern humans continued pushing out of Africa, through the Middle East, and into Europe. change was coming. Within the Chateauperonian layer, archaeologists find a type of spear point made by Neanderthals, which looks incredibly similar to points made at the same time by modern humans. It's as if the Neanderthals were copying the design. They may never have met the people who made the originals. All they needed was to find a discarded spear and work out for themselves how to make it. It looks like they have produced the same kind of object, but with their own technology. So the final product looks very much the same, but the method to produce it is different. To copy a technology without an instruction manual is a sign of intelligence. But it also spelt the beginning of the end for the Neanderthals. They were now playing catch-up. Their culture 
transformed by the presence of modern humans. Some have argued that Neanderthals invented these kind of objects independently from the modern humans, but it's kind of puzzling that they would do that just at the moment when modern humans moved into Europe. All right, so that clip talked about the evidence for symbolism with the pigmented and perforated shell beads, and it also delved into a little bit some of the arguments that some paleoanthropologists have had, have had about Neanderthals as it relates to complex stone tool technologies and culture, that they were simply um, imitating or slightly modifying the tools that were provided to them by Homo sapiens that were arriving in the area. And it's still up for debate, essentially. It's still deba a debated topic, whether it was Neanderthals or Homo sapiens that were responsible for the Chateau-Peronian artifacts. All right, so this is the hyoid bone I was telling you guys about. The hyoid bone is a U-shaped bone that's in the vocal tract that's really useful and important for reconstructing language capacities and capabilities. So it, it gives us the anatomical ability for speech, essentially. So... Oftentimes, if you're even interested in forensic anthropology, sometimes when you find a victim that has been strangled, the hyoid bone is often broken and or damaged during the process. So the hyoid bone, it's, it's within the larynx and it's important for language reconstructions. All right, so this is the Neanderthal Genome Project that was done by uh, Zalao, or not by Zalao, by uh, Svante Pablo, excuse me, by Svante Pablo. And this one analyzed 21 Neanderthal specimens from the Venja cave site in Croatia. And this is the study that it talked about briefly in the film clip we watched earlier in today's lecture, that once they were able to map the genome and once they were able to extract just the Neanderthal DNA, which is a very tedious process, took several years, they were able to uncover the fact that Neanderthal genomes share more similarities with Europeans and Western Asians. And this data suggests that between one and 4% of the genomes of anatomically modern humans are derived from Neanderthals. So even though this sounds like a small amount, this does give us fairly solid evidence that there was at least some degree of interbreeding between Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals, especially in the regions where they coexisted. So Europe, the Middle East, and, and Western Asia. All right, let's go ahead and pause there because I want you guys to have some time in your breakout rooms today. So just like we did last time, um, what I would suggest when you guys are in your, are in your breakout rooms, um, select somebody that wants to share their screen and work on those charts together because there's a lot of details that go along with each of these 